from all over the world. We consider you a part of our First Baptist Church family, and we hope you feel a part of what God is doing in and through First Baptist Dallas. No matter where you are, we hope and pray that this is a time you will grow in your relationship with God and others as we worship our Savior together. Welcome to worship. Good morning and welcome to worship at First Baptist Dallas today. Welcome guests and on campus viewers. Church, let's stand together as we gratefully sing, oh worship the King.
Lord of Lords, our Savior. He's fighting each and every battle for us today. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see, when all For his promise, you may be seated. Well, it is so good to see each and every one of you for worship this morning here at First Baptist Dallas. We welcome you along with our guests joining us in the room and on our iCampus. Guests, we do have a very special gift just for you today. It's our pastor's brand new devotional, Not All Roads Lead to Heaven devotional. 
100 daily readings about our only hope for eternal life. And guest, as you came in this morning, you received a worship guide. You're going to find enclosed this welcome card. Please take the time to fill this out. You can also scan the QR code. And at the conclusion of the service, please take your completed card with you. Right outside these worship center doors, guests, you're going to find our welcome center. Our staff is waiting there for you. You'll exchange your completed card for your gift, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have about our church. We look forward to meeting you. Now, guests, if you can't make it to the Welcome Center, we also have some boxes on your way out. You can place your completed card on one of those boxes, and we'll mail you a copy of your gift. For those joining us on iCampus, just follow that link provided on your screen for your welcome gift as well. Again, it is great to see each of you. Church family for worship today. So many exciting upcoming events in the life of our church. So let's take a moment now as we look together at the screen. Good morning. Here are a few upcoming events. Ladies, purchase your ticket today on the concourse for the first Dallas Women's Conference on April 12th and 13th, hosted by Unapologetics' Julia Jeffress Sadler. Here teaching from speakers Carrie Pomerale, Marion Jordan Ellis, Rebecca St. James, Trisha Lavorne Patterson, and Sheila Walsh in worship with the first Dallas band. For King & Country is here with us in worship next Sunday. Don't miss an inspiring morning of worship with the Grammy Award winning band and their sister, our resident artist, Rebecca St. James. That evening, come back for a viewing of their new movie, Unsung Hero, about the story of God's faithfulness to their family. Register today for a free ticket. Guest, you are invited for a special dinner with the pastor on April 18th at Maggiano's. Enjoy a complimentary meal, lively conversations, and a time of question and answer with Dr. Jeffers. Members, if you have made a profession of faith and have not yet followed it with Believer's Baptism, participate in Baptism Sunday on April 28th, presided over by Dr. Jeffers. Sign up today on the concourse. For more information on everything happening at our church, visit firstdallas.org slash events. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, and we'll read the first eight verses. Familiar verses, but most of us, it'll be more familiar in the King James Version. We're going to read from the New American Standard Bible, and those will be the words on the screen here in the Worship Center. iCampus, you'll have those words as well, so that wherever you are in this world, we can all join together in reading God's holy word. We invite you to stand with us to honor the reading of his word. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning with verse 1 and ending with verse 8. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice is calling. Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low, and let the rough ground become a plain, and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken." A voice called, call out. Then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. May God richly bless the reading of his word. Keep standing now. Tyler comes back and we continue our time of worship together. Church, this morning we have a hope and we have a future because he lives. 
I believe in the sun. I believe in the risen one. I believe I overcome by the power of his blood.
Let's praise the Lord. He lives today. Amen. You may be seated. And we do praise the Lord for all that he did over our past two weekends of Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. Let's celebrate together as we look at the screens. Church, you answered the call. Together, through the power of your invitations, we witnessed God move in the hearts of many throughout our city and beyond as we spread the message of our risen Savior far and wide. Holy Week began on Palm Sunday when hundreds of guests stepped foot into our church for the first time. During both morning and evening services, a total of 6,466 people joined together in worship, led by our choir and orchestra, the First Dallas Band, and Matthew West. Dr. Jeffers shared a powerful message, what's so good about Good Friday? That evening, we gathered to observe the Lord's Supper and partake in the elements that remind us of His ultimate sacrifice. Hundreds joined together to lift high the illuminated cross of Christ with the names of those you've been praying for. As we waved palm branches, we took the gospel beyond our four walls and into our city as we marched for eternal life to Clyde Warren Park and experienced a memorable sunset concert with Matthew West and the First Dallas Band. This Easter, we saw firsthand the power of God moving through our congregation as we were joined by 5,481 people in person and over 15 million people tuned in on the iCampus from 45 different countries. Our pastor boldly shared the gospel as he answered the three most important questions about Easter. Meanwhile, 972 kids experienced an interactive journey through the biblical story on the 10th anniversary of our Resurrection Road and Preschoolers Praise. This Palm Sunday and Easter, we had 110 people make the life-changing decision to trust in Christ as their Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for the victory over sin and death. And thank you, First Baptist Dallas family, for your faithfulness, love, and commitment to sharing the hope of Easter. Well, praise God for all he's doing here in our church at First Baptist Dallas. As you heard, at least 110 people trusted in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior through our Palm Sunday and our Easter services. One of those young men who placed his trust in Christ came down with tears in his eyes. And he said, when I came here, I was empty, but I am leaving here filled today. And that is what the gospel is all about, the salvation, the fulfillment that we can have through Jesus Christ. God is working, and God is working through you, church, as you invite, as you serve, as you give. You're investing your lives in our ministry strategy, Mission 1-8, our strategy to transform the world with the truth of God's word, one life at a time. God is doing incredible things. And I wanna thank you, church, for your commitment to him and to the ministries of First Baptist Dallas. We're so grateful for the guests that have attended over the last couple of weeks. We're grateful for the guests who are here today. We have many special guests who have joined us this morning. I wanna acknowledge one of them this morning, Dr. Amir Kaner is the president of Truett McConnell University in Cleveland, Georgia. He's here with us today and he'll be teaching in our President's Sunday School class in the next hour. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Kaner to our services today? And now we continue our time of worship through giving this morning. I'll remind you that you can leave your tithes and your offerings in the boxes as you exit this morning. You can also give those online at firstdallas.org. Right now, as we go to the Lord in prayer, I'll invite you to kneel all over the worship center. Gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you and we worship you. We know that unto you all praise and honor and glory and power is due to you and you alone. And this morning as we lift our voices up to you, we thank you 
for the joy of our salvation in Jesus Christ. We thank you for what you're doing here in our church, how you are transforming lives for all eternity, how you are healing the sick and mending broken hearts, Lord. We thank you for the faithfulness that we've experienced through the years, how for decades we have experienced your presence here in our church, your provision and your protection, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing now, and we pray in anticipation that you will continue to work through the ministries of First Baptist Dallas, that you would do more than we could ever ask or imagine. As our pastor proclaims the truth of your word throughout the world, as our people go out as lights in the darkness, Lord, we pray that we would be your ambassadors and that you truly would use us to transform the world with the truth of your word, to lead others to a saving faith in your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray all this in the saving name of Jesus, amen.
Thank you so much, tremendous First Dallas Choir and Orchestra for your music today. We welcome those of you who've joined us in our day one service and the, you saw literally millions of people who watch us on our First Dallas I campus and our social media platforms around the country. Thank you for tuning in to First Baptist Dallas. Well, you're in for a treat today. Our guest preacher is Dr. O.S. Hawkins, our great friend. And uh, for those of you watching who may not be familiar with Dr. Hawkins, Dr. Hawkins has been the pastor of uh, several of the most respected churches in our country, including First Baptist Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and our own First Baptist Dallas, where he and Susie served uh, from 1993 to 1997. When Dr. Hawkins left here, he went to be CEO for 25 years of Guidestone Financial Services, which oversees billions of dollars of assets of churches, denominations, and Christian organizations around the world. During all of his spare time, he's managed to write over 50 books, including the best-selling code series that so many of us have enjoyed, his latest book, and I think his best, is the one that was just released this past week on Dr. Chris Wool, entitled Chris Wool, His Life and Times. Now, there have been some good biographies of Dr. Chris Wool's about Dr. Chris Wool. Billy Keith's book decades ago was a great book, but this is the most definitive book on the life of Dr. Chris Wool I've ever read. I was privileged to do the foreword to it. I've actually read it twice in the last two weeks because it is just packed with all kind of information. You know, there is no one man who shaped First Baptist Dallas in its 156 years more than Dr. Chris Wolf. And uh, his story is really the story of First Baptist Church Dallas. And I would just say to our members, I hope every one of you will get a copy of the book. For those of you who lived during the Chris Wolf years, you'll enjoy reading the stories and the backstory to significant events in our church's history. For those of you, many of you, who are new members to our church. You've been here in the last decade or so and may not be familiar with Dr. Criswell. You will come to understand our church even better. You'll understand why this church was literally built on the Bible. Dr. Criswell's favorite verse is what we read, Isaiah 48. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And you'll have more understanding about that as you read this very fascinating and entertaining book. Let me just say a personal word about O.S. and Susie Hawkins. As I said, they served here from 1993 to 1997. And though their time chronologically was brief, it was deeply impactful. The Hawkins came to our church after a very tumultuous time in the history of our church. It was a time, frankly, that our church came the closest to splitting it has ever come. But God knew what this church needed. It needed O.S. and Susie Hawkins. And they came and helped still the waters and remind our congregation of the importance of loving one another and working together with one another. And they gave this church the best gift they could have given, the gift of hope for the future. And today, decades later, we're still profiting as a church. We're benefiting from the foundation O.S. and Susie Hawkins laid in this congregation. So we want to say thank you for your investment in our church. Would you join me in giving a First Baptist welcome to our good friend, Dr. O.S. Hawkins. Well, I think I'm going to need to get busy working on the biography of Robert Jeffers next, after that beautiful introduction. I look forward to seeing you out in the lobby afterwards and be happy to sign these. You know, it's said of good King Josiah in chapter uh, 23 of 2 Kings that before him, there was no king like him who loved the Lord with all of his heart. And after him, there never arose one like him. I, I think that of Dr. W.A. Criswell. 
He, he had no peer in his day. And as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, what I want to do today is what he said to them in the fifth chapter, in the 12th verse, when he said, honor those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord, esteem them highly in love uh, for their work's sake. W.A. Criswell was pastor of this church for a half of a century, for 50 years. When he came here in 1944, the church had been in a two-decade-long decline. And he said in his first few messages, he said, I just preached to wood. I looked out and all I saw were the wooden backs of pews all over the lower floor and the wooden backs of the theater seats in the balcony. But in the first year of that ministry, 1,000 happy new members joined our church in the first 12 months of his pastorate. Just think of that. An explosion took place. In fact, Dr. Crystal lived in every single decade of the 20th century. And that's why the book is entitled Crystal, His Life and Times, because it's really also about all the times culturally that were swirling around him in the ministry he had received from the Lord here today. As I mentioned, he, he really, in his half of a century of service, had no peer. There are a lot of Dallas Maverick fans here today, I'm sure. You speak of Dirk, I can speak of Luca. A lot of cowboy fans here today. You speak of Aikman, I'll speak of Staubach. But when it comes to a pastor theologian who led a church to be the largest church in the world in its time, W.A. Criswell, in his 50 years in this place, had no peer. 30 years ago, when he was 85, I was pastor here. And I put him in a room over in Grace Parlor in the old building that's no longer here with a video camera, just the two of us, no one else. And for two hours, I interviewed him about circumstances, situations, people, all about his life for two to three hours. Knowing that one day I would write his biography, he asked me, Son, make sure that you don't do that until 20 years after I'm dead. And after other people were dead, too, for that matter. And I kept his promise. He's been in heaven for 22 years now. And the time had come to put that together. I've been working on it, Susie can tell you, for, for 20 years over this time. You know, Robert Jeffers and I, you may not know this, but we, we belong to the same fraternity. Now, it wasn't in college. He went to Baylor. I went to the more elite Harvard of the South at TCU over in Fort Worth. But we're members of a fraternity. We're very selective. There are only two people in our fraternity because the, to be in that fraternity, you have to be a person that Dr. Crystal, in his heart, felt like God had put upon his heart to be successors and pastor of this church. And what I like to think about, volleyball is becoming very popular in college sports today. And there are two main players in volleyball. There's a setter one who dives and sets the ball up at the net. Then there's that spiker, that striker who comes and, and, and spikes the net, oh, the ball over the net. I like to think that God used us in our days here uh, to, set, to set the ball up, to set it. The church was very divisive after a tumultuous time when we came here and we watched God do a beautiful thing of bringing it together as giving us hope, as he said. And I like to think God may have used me to, to set it up for somebody to come in and spike it. Little did we know Robert Jeffers would jump as high, spike as hard and as ferociously, and we would see what we see here today uh, in this church. And thank God for it. 
I tell people everywhere, these facilities, over $250 million debt-free, that are reaching multiplied thousands of millions of people today in this morning hour all over the world. Uh, there's First Baptist Dallas in its facilities and every other church in the world. Uh, Zali Jaffe is here today. I've got two friends from Jerusalem. Mike Evans, who is the founder of the Friends of Zion Museum, one of the most beautiful interactive museums you'll see anywhere, honoring those of us who are evangelicals who stood with the state of Israel through the years. Just recently, they gave to Dr. Jeffers the Friends of Zion Award that few people have received in the state of Israel. We thank God for that. I also have my dear friend Zali Jaffe, who's here today. Uh, Dr. Chris will introduce me to Zali Jaffe 35 years ago. Uh, Mr. Jaffe is, was one of Dr. Criswell's closest, dearest friends. He is an international lawyer. He's advisor and counsel to prime ministers, now to, pre, to Prime Minister Netanyahu. Jaffe is president of the Great Synagogue in Jerusalem, the most famous synagogue in the world. I've been waiting for a long time to stand up here and open the Bible and preach the gospel to this Jew, and he's sitting right here on the front row today. And I love Zali Jaffe like my own flesh, and he's come all the way from Jerusalem to honor the life of Dr. Criswell today. You know, Dr. Criswell had a great relationship with the state of Israel. In 1948, just weeks after the War of Independence was over, he was one of the first ones to journey to Jerusalem, one of the first evangelicals to go, just to, just to have a ministry of presence there among those people who had just won that war of independence in 1948. And by a chance meeting with David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel at the King David Hotel, the prime minister and Dr. Crystal became fast friends that lasted until Prime Minister Ben-Gurion died. In fact, in the 1950s, Ben-Gurion invited Criswell to speak at a science symposium that was being held at the famous Weizmann Institute in Rehoboth in Israel. And there's a picture of Ben-Gurion, the prime minister, seated on the dais next to Dr. Criswell, and they are in uproarious laughter. And the picture appeared in Time magazine, newspapers, and magazines all over the world. And the backstory is the prime minister and Dr. Crystal were seated at the end of the dais. There was a scientist from the Weizmann Institute speaking. Now, this is in the 50s. This is 70 years ago. And this man was saying from that lectern that there's going to come a day when we're going to see babies made in test tubes. Of course, we... We're very familiar with that today. But no one had hardly ever heard of that. The prime minister nudged Dr. Crystal and he said, did you hear what that man said? And Crystal said, yes. He nudged him again. He said, I said, did you hear what he said? He said, yes, prime minister. He said, someday we're going to make babies in test tubes. And the prime minister whispered in his ear, that may be true, but I'll always like the old way better. And they began to laugh. Now you know the backstory story of, of that picture. In 1995, when Dr. Crystal was in his 85th year, he wanted to go to Israel for a final time, that place he had been so many, many times, that place he loved. And Susie and I, and Betty and Dr. Crystal, his wife, we, we journeyed to Israel. And Zali Jaffe, who's here today, arranged a meeting with us with Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, that crusty war hero of the 67 war and several of the wars of Israel, was then the prime minister. And we went to his office for a meeting, Dr. Crystal, myself, Zali, and we walked in and we were seated in his office. He was in another room. In a moment, he walked in and, and we could tell he was a bit irritated uh, he must have been in some very important meeting and now was having to be interrupted by a couple of evangelicals from America. And he came in and he seated himself in a chair between Dr. Criswell and myself. And I can see it now. He put his hands on the arms of the chair, old rough, callous-handed hands of that old crusty war general. 
And before a word was said, Dr. Crystal just reached down and touched his hand and started patting it. And he said, now, sweet boy, let me tell you why we're here. And he began to talk to him of the Jewish prophets, of Ezekiel in chapter 36, of Daniel in chapter 4, how they prophesied hundreds of years before that the Jewish people would be scattered all over the world. He went on to, to talk about how uh, Daniel said in, 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 in the same thing, how that, how that uh, Amos in chapter 9 said that they would be brought back from all over the world, how Isaiah added that from, they would be coming back from all the nations all over the world into their own land, how that God had promised to Jacob in that covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he would give them that land for an everlasting covenant. And we watched that prime minister melt under the loving touch of Dr. Criswell. A few days later, we flew back, and we were safely home at Dallas. Just a few weeks later, Rabin was felled by an assassin's bullet in a peace rally in Tel Aviv. Dr. Criswell loved Israel. He loved Israel, and he believed that if God did not keep his covenant promises to Israel, how could we have any assurance that he would keep his promises to us? And on this day, which is incidentally the six-month anniversary of the great massacre on October 7th in Israel when everything changed, it's fitting to remember, in fact, there's a whole chapter here. Zali was the one that, that gave the quote. I quote him in there. He said, in fact, if you go to Israel, there's a, there's a forest of 10,000 trees up by Mount Tabor, the W.A. Crystal Forest dedicated in his honor. Prime ministers acknowledged him, gave him honor after honor. It was Zali Jaffe, who's here today, who said, to speak of evangelical support of the state of Israel without mentioning the name W.A. Criswell would be like giving a lecture on the circulation system, the circulatory system of your body without ever mentioning the heart. Dr. Criswell was born in utter poverty, and yet he rose to engage his culture like no one I've ever known. If he had gone into politics, he would have been a senator, perhaps president of the United States. Had he gone into law, he would have been a Supreme Court justice, I've got no doubt. Had he gone into business, most likely he would have built a Fortune 500 company. All he ever wanted to do, all he ever desired to do was be the pastor of a local New Testament church. And it was my privilege to live life and love him. For Susie and I, we vacationed with, with the Crystals in the summers along the way. I first met him in 1968. I was a student at TCU. I was a pre-law student, had just been called to preach. And my pastor that led me to Christ two or three years earlier, Fred Swank, was speaking at a banquet here at First Baptist Dallas. And I drove him to the banquet because he had cataracts. And we went into Dr. Criswell's office, and no young priest meeting the Pope in Rome was more impressed than I was on that day. The next year, he wrote his great book, Why I Preach the Bible is Literally True, 1969. And my brave 18-year-old fiancé, who's still sitting down here with me today, bought a copy, came over, barged into his office unannounced, and had him sign it for me as a Christmas gift. There was no one like him. I wrote this book to bring some balance to his life. He was a polarizing figure in many ways. And many of the people who stood against what he stood for will find a balance in his life here. And it's not a hagiography. He, he didn't want it to be. He wanted me to tell the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that's exactly what you're going to read uh, in this biography that I hold in my hand of Dr. Criswell. Uh, I wrote it because I want to introduce, as Robert said, new generations to his life. Because there are so many life lessons that all of us can learn from this book. 
The book is replete with a lot of stories that old timers here are going to remember, like the wheelbarrow sermon. Uh, if you don't know it, you're going to love to read about that, and especially Mrs. Crystal's comments related to it. Uh, you're going to read about the debate he had with Madeline Murray O'Hare when prayer had been taken out of the public schools. Uh, you're going to read so many things and so many untold things, not just things that we're aware of, how he spent those last four years of his life, what life was like behind the closed doors of the parsonage on Swiss Avenue. You'll read about a prominent and well-known member of First Baptist Church whose sister-in-law purported to have seen him in a clandestine meeting with Lee Harvey Oswald a week before November 22nd, 1963. There are so many stories woven into this book that have not yet ever been told. So, as we think about it, I remember Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So how can we come to a place in our lives where we can learn some lessons from Dr. Criswell that we can imitate, that we can be as a part of our lives. What, was the, what were the keys of his life? I would say three things primarily. I've said the same things, incidentally, about your pastor because they're true. Dr. Criswell had incredible influence, more influence in his day and his generation, the first, the second half of the, of the 20th century than any other single preacher in America, perhaps, I guess, I'm sure, in the world. He was not just a pastor. He was a theologian. He was brilliant. He read the languages of Scripture, Hebrew and Greek, with fluency every single morning. He was brilliant. He could talk on any subject, and yet he had such a pastor's heart. During my days here, he was still active, and, and I've seen him go as we would go to the deathbed of a dying saint that he had pastored for decades and watch him hold their hands and weep. And then start to sing, I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and clear, and I feel like traveling home. He had a pastor's heart. There, there was no one like him and a tremendous influence. Why? Because there are three things about his life I want you to take with you today. And the same is true of Christ. The same thing is true of anyone who is an influencer. He always knew where he was going. He always knew who he was. He didn't try to be the second coming of George W. Truett, the great pastor that preceded him for 47 and a half years here, a world figure. He didn't try to be the second coming of Truett. He was the first coming of Criswell. He knew who he was. And thirdly, he knew why he was here. First, think about it. He knew where he was, like Jesus. Remember, Jesus always knew where he was going. Remember in John 4, he said, listen, we're not going that. I must needs go through Samaria. I've got to go this way. Jesus never got to an intersection and wrung his hands and didn't know which way to turn because he always knew where he was going. Same is true with Dr. Criswell. You'll read in here that he had two great influences in life. One was Dr. Truett, the stately pastor of this church for 47 and a half years who preached to the world from that, this pulpit. The other was J. Frank Norris, the fiery fundamentalist pastor of the First Baptist Church in Fort Worth. In the 1920s, it was the largest church in the entire world. His father was a staunch supporter of Norris, and his mother a devotee of Truett. His father thought Norris was the greatest preacher that ever lived. His mother thought all he was trying to do was tear down our Baptist denomination. And he lived his life every dinner table hearing this debate between Norris and Truett. You know, there's a nautical term called convergence, where two great rivers that are running alongside each other come together and form into one and form a greater river. And that's what happened. Because when you really study the life of Dr. Criswell, he was Truett on the outside, a statesman, had a presence. He'd walk into any room and everybody would turn and look at him. He was truant on the outside. He serenely stayed above the fray. He tried to get everybody else to fight his battles for him so he could stay above the fray like Truett. 
but he was Norris on the inside. A fighting fundamentalist who always valued doctrinal fidelity above denominational loyalty. And these two warring factors were in his life. His mother insisted he become a medical doctor. His mother had great influence on his life. She went with him to Baylor University, lived with him his first year at Baylor. She hovered over him. She doted over him. Uh, And she always wanted him to be a medical doctor, always told him he was going to be a medical doctor, like her father, David Curry, who, as Dr. Crystal said so often, was a Civil War surgeon, his grandfather. David When I researched this book, actually, I found out that Dr. Curry, David Curry, Crystal's grandfather, the Civil War surgeon, I found a man out in Concho County out by Paint Rock, Texas on a ranch who is the curator of all things Curry. His name is David Curry. He is the great-grandson of Crystal's grandfather. He's done all the family research. He told me, he said, you know, Crystal's grandfather was not a medical doctor. I said, oh, no, but his mother, he, Dr. Crystal, I've heard him say a hundred times he was a Civil War so He said, no, he was, a, he was a physician's assistant. And in those medical tents on the battlefields, he would assist the physicians in amputations. That was his job. And when the war was over, he moved to Concho County and became the saddleback doctor and traveled all over, ministering to people with medicine in his saddlebags. And he told everyone he was a graduate of Harvard Medical School. And this man told me, I said, well, what, what, what was that about? And he said, well, finally, when he was confronted with it, and he could not hide under that guys anymore. He just said, well, listen, if you're going to lie about being a medical doctor, you might as well lie about going to Harvard. And, but Mrs., but Crystal's mother always wanted him to be a medical doctor. People in text line where he grew up would come up and say, oh, your mother tells me you're going to be a doctor. From a little child, he'd say, no, I'm going to be a pastor. That's all he ever wanted to do was pastor a local New Testament church, to be a pastor. You know, he spent his first 10 years, while he rose to incredible fame here in this church for 50 years, a world figure, he spent the first 10 years of being a pastor in virtual obscurity. He pastored, his first church was at a place called Devil's Bend. How would you like to be that as your first church? Where are you, Pastor? Out out at Devil's Bend. Then he was pastor at Pecan Grove. And then at White Mound. And then at Mount Washington. For 10 years. Sunday after Sunday, he would open the book of God in those little out-of-the-way places to the people of God, preparing for what God was going to do when he burst forth from obscurity, much like Moses and all those years on the backside of a desert before he became the emancipator of his people. It's nothing new in the making of a person of God to absent ourselves, to take in so we can later give out. It it was much like Joshua, 40 years in the wilderness with Canaan in his heart, or Joseph in an Egyptian dungeon, or Jesus, 30 years in a carpenter's shop before he burst forth to change the world and bring us to this place today. We were down the Heritage Center with our friends from Jerusalem. Early this morning, I saw pictures of three women down there. Dr. Criswell, there were three. You know, there's something about Jesus. Jesus attracted women in his ministry. Same with Jerome when he translated the Latin Vulgate. He was financed by those Italian women. Mary, Minnie Slaughter Veal, the daughter of the famed cattle baron and oil man, Colonel Slaughter, gave millions of dollars to see Crystal's vision fulfilled. Mary Crowley, who came here as a single mother, broke to go to business school, drawn business school, and 
And under the preaching of Dr. Crystal, decided she could do anything, and she went out and founded Home in Tears. It became one of the leading companies in the world who gave millions of dollars to this church. And sweet Ruth Hunt, one of the godliest, sweetest prayer partners and women I've ever known, wife of, at that time, purported to be the richest man in the world, H.L. Hunt, who gave millions and millions of dollars that we might have all this property that's around us that enabled you as a church in our day and age today to do what you've done on this property. So many who've come before us because Dr. Criswell always knew where he was going. He had that calling to be a pastor. That's all he ever wanted to do. Secondly, he knew who he was very briefly. He knew who he was. Same as Christ, he knew who he was. Truett was here for 47 and a half years. He died on July the 7th, 1944. Within three months, Criswell, who nobody on the pulpit committee had ever heard his name, three months after Truett's death, preached here and became pastor of this church. He had an incredible dream that we read about in this book that tells you what manifested itself there. And one of his greatest attributes that I see in the life of W.A. Criswell was his ability to own his mistakes. Not everybody could do that. He had a unique ability to own his mistakes uh, and, and, do, and, it, and, and we see it over and over and over. We see it with the Catholic Church. You know, in 1960, there were three men in this city who vehemently fought against the election of John F. Kennedy as President of the United States because he was a Roman Catholic. And since he believed that the Pope was infallible, they feared that the Pope of Rome would have overt influence over the policies of the United States government with a Catholic in the White House. Ted Dealey, publisher of the Dallas Morning News. H.L. Hunt, before there was ever a Rush Limbaugh or a Fox News, H.L. Hunt had a program on the radio called Lifeline that reached millions and millions of people each day with his conservative uh, viewpoints. He and then W.A. Criswell who preached fervently. Crystal would preach sermons about that, and, and, and Hunt would print them up by the millions and distribute them all over the country. And then he met the Pope in the 1970s, and in a beautiful meeting, had a whole change of heart. Abortion. He had the unique ability to admit his mistakes, correct them, and go forward. You know, in 1973, the Supreme Court in January made abortion legal in the United States. Roe v. Wade. Wade was the district attorney here in Dallas. Roe was Norma McCovey, a, a woman who had sued the district attorney for the ability to have an abortion. And on the Sunday after that Supreme Court decision, had you been in First Baptist Church, Dallas, you wouldn't have heard a word about it. Dr. Criswell had never mentioned it. He, in those times, he believed that the, where the Bible says that God breathed into us the breath of life, he believed that's when life began, as did many evangelical preachers, W.O. Vaught and so many others. He had a change of heart as he read the scriptures. He said he read like Jeremiah saying, before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. Isaiah saying, I, I called you by name before you were born. The, the psalm is saying, I knit you in your inmost parts and was strong enough to admit his wrong and change his way. Same with the issue of race. He inherited a church in 1944 that was deeply embedded with the stain of white supremacy. When I came here in 93, there was a book called Big D. Darwin Payne, a professor at SMU, had just written it. Thick book, History of Dallas. And I read that book because I was here and I wanted to know more about the city of Dallas. And in it, he says, in 1921... The largest Ku Klux Klan cell in America was in Dallas, 13,000 dues-paying members, and he lists the hundreds members of the steering committee. I thought, wow. I called downstairs from my pastor's office to Dean Willis, 
down in the records. I said, Dean, do we keep records every year of the church membership? He said, yeah. I said, well, put out 1921. I want to come down there this afternoon and go through it. I took that list of the 100 members of the steering committee. Dozens and dozens, doctors and lawyers and civic leaders and city fathers and business people, deacons in our church. We're not just members of that organization, but on the steering committee of that organization. And sadly, Dr. Criswell allowed himself to fit into that mold. He was known as a segregationist. It was one of the greatest regrets of his life. The biggest blunder of his life, ever speaking about that, he said, and he spent the rest of his life trying to atone for it. That's why today I rejoice. Last time I preached here between the services, I walked through the children's division. I saw beautiful African-American children and Asian children and Hispanic children and young families. I, I thought I was walking through the United Nations to see what this church has become today. But one of the secrets and genius of Crystal's life was that ability to recognize his mistakes and overcome them. He lived with three great regrets, he told me in that video interview. I won't spoil them for you. Many of us go through life, say we have no regrets. He had three great regrets he took with him to the grave. Dr. Criswell knew who he was. He was a person of integrity, lived a life, spotless life, without any hint of moral failure in money or morals or any other thing. And thirdly, we can learn from him. He knew why he was here. He had a sense of purpose. Like Jesus, he said, my meat, the thing that sustains me is to do the will of him who sent me while there's yet time. He surrendered his life to the preaching ministry at 10 years of age, went down the aisle in revival service at Text Line, and nobody recognized him. They recognized all the others, and, and it was, he just slipped over and went back and sat in his seat. That's why all of those years, he would take time with every person who came forward in the invitation to talk to him. Some of you people had to stay in church an extra 30 minutes, remember, while he spoke because he didn't want anyone to feel slighted. Some of the funniest things ever happened happened there. One of them about a lady in a red dress, Susie won't let me tell and wouldn't let me put in the book, but it's pretty funny. Fritz von Erich, the great world champion wrestler, came down the aisle to make a profession of faith one time. Chris was standing, talking to him in the front, put the microphone, said, Fritz, tell these people what Christ has done with you. And the world heavyweight wrestling champion took that microphone and said, all I can say, preacher, is that was the blankety blankettest good sermon I've ever heard from somebody and just let off a stream. Of, and you should have seen Chris wrestling that microphone out of the hand of the world champion. He never lost sight of who he was. Let me just wrap this up about just how he died. You know, uh, you're, you're never ready to live until you're ready to die. He spent the last four years of his life in a hospital bed in the den of Jack Pogue. Jack sleeping on the couch or often on the floor by his bed, taking care of his needs 24-7 for four years, 1,500 nights. And let me just read you one page as I close. Crystal spent his final weeks with a piece about him that passed all understanding. Three decades earlier, in a sermon in the Dallas pulpit, he had closed with this prayer. Listen to this prayer he prayed. Oh, Lord, as I grow older, may I not become cynical or bitter, but may my love for you be deeper and wider May my faith in the things of glory be clearer and nearer as I approach them. Lord, let it be that I might be sweet and kind, full of faith, full of hope in you. 32 years later, God proved faithful in answering that prayer as Chris will do near and near to heaven with a supernatural sweetness and kindness that came with each passing day. And as the end drew near, Jack would often be awakened in night as Crystal in his sleep would begin to preach. Jack reported that night after night after night, he was preaching in his sleep. It wasn't some occasional happening. It was night after night. I used to lie there and thank God that even in his unconscious hours, he was preaching Christ. Many of those nights, he would say to Jack, get the counselors ready. There's going to be a great response to the invitation. Even in his sleep, he kept his eyes on Jesus. 
centered on the cross. Twelve days before he died, he lost all his ability to talk. He would just stare into time and into space, unable to say anything. I dropped by daily. During that period and struggled to see that great old warrior state uncommunicative as though he was not even present, as though his body was there, but he had taken leave. Two days before his death, after not speaking for days, Mac Brunson came to see him. Pogue inter- brought Brunson into the room and he said, Dr. Criswell, Dr. Brunson is here to see you. And Criswell opened his eyes and said, Oh, have you come for the revival? And those were his last words. That's what lived in his heart. His dying wish was to be buried with a Bible on his chest, open to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, we read a moment ago. For 22 years, he's been over there at Sparkman Hillcrest in that tomb with a Bible on his chest. Open to Isaiah 40, verse 8, that says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. He gave his invitations. We all remember them. At the end of his sermon, he would say, A family, you. A couple, you. A single, you. A young person, just one somebody you to come to Jesus, to join the fellowship of the church. And through the decades, thousands upon thousands upon thousands fill those aisles to do just that. Yes, as is said of King Josiah, before him there was no king like him that loved the Lord with all his heart. And after him, there's never been one that's risen like him. Let's bow our hearts together as we pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed across this room. And let me just ask you as we close, as the pastor makes ready to come, do you know where you're going? Some of you have no direction in life. You don't know, you don't know where you're headed. You're, you're, just, you're not living, you're just existing. Some of you watching online today, all over this world, where are you headed in life? Do you know who you are? Some of us are still trying to be somebody else. You'll, you'll, uh, you'll realize who you are when Christ comes to live in you and you'll find your self-worth in him. Why, Christ, why Paul said, Christ in me, the hope of glory. And finally, do you know why you're here? You're here to make the great discovery and begin the great adventure for which God called you to know him in the intimacy of father and child in the free pardoning of sin. Jesus died on a cross for your sin. He was buried. He rose again, the triumphant living Lord. He said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. And I'd like the privilege of leading you right now in this prayer where you can just pray. Making sure God gives you direction in life. That you Begin the great adventure for which you've created. If that's the desire of your heart, just say, Dear Lord Jesus, in your heart, go ahead. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Lord, forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Come in today. Come in to stay. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. And as an expression of the fact you believe he's not a liar, we'll do what he said he'd do. Just say, Thank you, Jesus for coming into my life right now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, thank you so much for being here today. Those of you who have watched online, we want to say a word to you that, uh, first of all, for those of you online, if you prayed that prayer to trust in Christ as your Savior. There's a link at the top of the screen you can click on to say you prayed the prayer. We have some free material to send you about what it means to live your life as a Christian. So click on that link if you would. For those of you in day one and here in our worship center, take out the card that's in your bulletin.
And there's a place for you to register to say that you prayed that prayer with Dr. Hawkins and just check that second box, I prayed the prayer to trust in Christ. Maybe you'd like to join First Baptist Dallas as so many did last week. You can actually join our church by checking that third box. We'll be in touch with you about some uh, membership information. And then let me say, if you are a guest and would like to know more about our church, I want to invite you to have dinner with me a week from this Thursday night, April 18th at Maggiano's at North Park. We call it Dinner with the Pastor, and it'll be your chance to ask any question you want about the life, the ministry of First Baptist Dallas. Check that box and let us know of your interest, and we will uh, get with you this week. Most of all, if you're a guest, let us know that as well. When you have finished uh, with this card, if you will take it uh, to the Welcome Center, we will exchange your card for our newest gift to all of our guests today. It's my new devotional book that came out this week entitled, Not All Roads Lead to Heaven, 100 Daily Readings About Our Only Hope for Eternal Life. And this is our gift to all of our guests today for attending First Baptist Dallas. Now, don't forget, Dr. Hawkins is going to be out on the concourse to sign copies of his book on the life of Dr. Criswell, and uh, be sure and stop by and get a copy of the book. You will enjoy it. Speaking of which, didn't you enjoy Dr. Hawkins this morning? Let's show us our appreciation to him. It's a great message, and I know we'll all be interested in reading the book. Thank you so much for being here. Don't forget, next Sunday, our special guest, Rebecca St. James and for King and Country, they'll be leading worship, and I'll be continuing our series in the book of Ephesians, Holy Living in an Unholy World. Thank you for being here today. Let's stand together now as Tyler comes to lead us in our final song. Thank you, Pastor. What a great morning of worship. Let's sing God's praise together. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Day, church. Hello, I'm Emmanuel Pendula, but you can call me Manny, your I campus pastor. Thanks for joining us for worship. I hope you feel uplifted and encouraged after today's service. Continue to spread the joy by inviting your loved ones to join us every week and stay connected on our social media platforms and iCampus Global Facebook group, where you'll find inspiring content, updates, and connect with believers worldwide. Also, join our iCampus community for a Sunday School lesson taught by Ryland Whitehorn, our Executive Pastor of Ministries at 8.30, 9.15, and 11 a.m. Central Time. I look forward to personally getting to know you, so be sure to leave a message in the chat about how I can pray and minister to you. Remember, we're here to serve you every Sunday morning and throughout the week in your spiritual walk. Stay blessed and see you soon.